Welcome back to negotiation and today we're going to go a little bit more into detail and what are we going to go into detail about? We're going to be looking at distributive tactics. Now distributive tactics are interesting because it's a continuation of unit number four where we talked about what? Distributive negotiation. So we began talking about distributive negotiation last time and now we're going to go into more detail. Now remember, a couple units back, we talked about what are your four strategies you can choose from, right? And one of those strategies was competition. That is, I need to try to win. Why do I need to try to win? Because the outcome is important to me, right? Now if the outcome is important to you, you have to compete. What if you choose a different strategy? What if you choose a collaboration? Well, it still may be the case that for the other side, competition is their strategy. So. You know, it's very complicated, these combinations of strategies, your side, the other side, and maybe there's multiple teams, like in our simulation, we're going to have more than one team. So today we're going to go looking into more of distributive, that means I win, you lose, you lose, I win, or win-lose. We're going to spend some more time on that before we move on to another topic. And today we're going to look at the tactics, that is, how do you execute it? So before we've looked at strategies, that is the overall plan, the overall idea, and now we're going to move on and we're going to look at tactics. What do tactics mean? Tactics mean exactly how do you execute it? How do you do it? It's easy for me to say something like, well, you need to, you need to use a distributive approach. That is, I need to make the other side win. I need to get some of their secret information. I need to guess things like their resistance point. I need to guess things like their target point. It's easy to say, but then how do you do it? So today I'm going to focus on how do you do it? So let's go ahead and look at the introduction to this chapter. And the most important distributive, the most important thing in distributive bargaining is to maximize. What does maximize mean? We've already talked about this. It means get the most that you can. It doesn't mean that you have to get everything that's on your list. It doesn't mean you have to get everything that's in your goal package, but you try to maximize. You try to gain the most and lose the least. The most important tool one has to do this is information. So negotiation is all about information, but here, how do you get the most and lose the least? You need to make sure you have information. The less information you give to the other side, and the more information you get about the other side, the better your deal will be. That means the more you will maximize. Again, we're right back to the same thing, and I hate to keep repeating it, but it's so important. Right? It's so important. You need to keep your secret information secret and you need to try to guess or you try to get the other side's secret information. And how do you do that? Well, today we're going to look at some tactics for doing that. In a distributed negotiation, the negotiator wants to, number one, find the other side's resistance point. Remember the resistance point? The other side will not go over or the other side will not go under. That means the buyer will not pay more than and the seller will not sell for less than. That's the resistance point. You don't want to be past the resistance point because that will end the negotiation. Number two, influence the other side's guesses. Now here's a really good one. What do I mean by influence the other side's guesses. That means the other side does not know your secret information. The other side does not know your target price. The other side does not know your resistance points. So what do you do? You try to influence the other side. That is, make them think something and it's not really true. Make them believe something even though it's not really true. That's influence the guesses. Influence the other side's outcome valuations. Influence the other side's outcome valuations. 
What does this mean? Well, this is saying that change what the other side thinks about what they get, right? So remember a couple units ago, I was talking about, I think I'll buy this cup. Very easy example, right? Well, I have to think about what do I want? What's my goal package? What's my target price? What's my resistance point? I think of all these things. But now if you can talk to me and you say, well, you know, this, price, this cup is really excellent. It's a collector's edition. It's very famous and there's only 100 of them made. If you tell me this, you make me change what I think about the cup. So originally I wanted to get $80 price, but now I think, hmm, maybe I can accept a higher price. I can pay more because if I get this, I'm, I'm getting more. So that's the outcome. What do I get compared to what do I give? And so if you can convince me this cup is really special, really great, really something, you're changing what I think I get. So then I would change what I'm willing to give. And that's what we mean by change the outcome valuation. Influence the cost of delaying or leaving the negotiation. That means you're going to change how much it costs for the other side to stop negotiation or for the other side to walk away from the negotiation. That is, if the resistance point is reached or you get very close to the resistance point, the other side may stop. If you get too close to my resistance point, you make the price over my resistance point, I should stop. But if you can change something, making me feel that, well, leaving this negotiation. If I stop, I can't buy this cup anywhere else. There's no place else you can get it. This is the only one place. Then you change my valuation of this leaving the negotiation. You influence what I think about that. So by changing that, you change my willingness to adjust my target or adjust my uh, limits. So influence the cost of delaying or leaving. Each of these efforts will make the negotiation outcome more favorable. Of course, it depends on which side you're talking from, right? Uh, favorable for one side, unfavorable for the other side. Okay, so what we're looking at today is how to actually execute, how to do the distributive bargaining. What can you do to help you get more and lose less? Let's understand this better by looking at a couple examples. You know, I like to use these examples here. So let's start with Jane and, um, who is it? Jane and Fred, Jane and Fred today. So Jane says, we can't buy the newest HD television because we don't have enough money saved. So the situation is Jane and Fred want to buy a television. Fred says, well, what is the upper limit we can afford? So now we're gonna get up to the resistance point. So I wanna buy the TV, but what's our resistance point is the question. Jane says, I don't think we can afford any of these televisions. They are all too expensive. And Fred responds, yeah, I guess they are kind of expensive. And Jane says, I think we can hold out for a couple more years and just keep what we've got. Okay, now this is a very easy to understand, straightforward situation. Very simple, right? Fred and Jane have something in common. They also have something different. What's in common? The TV they have now is too old. They want to get a better one, a new one. So they go shopping and they look at some HD TVs. And what do they find out? The price is over. The price is over the resistance point, higher than the resistance point. Remember, if you go over the resistance point for the buyer, the buyer is just going to say, I'm not going to buy. It costs too much. I'm walking away. I'm not going to negotiate. So Jane says, hey, that's over. That's over our resistance point. I don't want to buy. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm done. But Fred, you see, Fred does want to buy. He doesn't say it too clearly yet, but he does want to buy. So what does he say to influence Jane? Fred says, that's true. 
We can get by. But I was just thinking of your mother. And Jane responds, what about my mother? And Fred says, well, you know your parents have that Sony HD television and your mother really is picky about the TV quality when she watches her shows. Jane says, I see what you mean. And Fred says, and isn't your mother going to stay with us in the summer for a month? If it was just for us, I would say we don't really need it. But this is important for your mother also. And Jane says, okay, I agree we need to get a better television, but we should shop around more and compare more prices. So what just happened there? Fred says, that's a good idea, but you know LG has a special offer this week. We don't need to make any payment for two months. And Jane says, maybe that's a good deal. So if we look at this situation with Jane and Fred, I think it's a great little example, easy to understand. Jane and Fred have something in common. They have something a little bit different. No, it's a little bit secret. We don't know exactly, but it looks like Fred really wants to buy that new TV. And Jane, well, Jane's a little bit worried about how much money they have. And so what do they do? Before the negotiation, Jane and Fred, they think of what's their target price, right? What's their resistance point? Resistance point, target price. What did they find out? They went to the store. The prices are above, above the resistance point. So game over, no TV. And what does Fred do? Fred says, yeah, right, I agree. It's above our resistance point, but let me remind you something. Your mother, Jane, your mother, she likes to watch TV and she has a special TV, a special quality HD TV. And with a special quality HD TV, she's very picky. So she's gonna come to our house. She's going to stay for one month. Is she gonna be happy? Do you want your mother to not be happy? I'm okay. I'm worried about your mother. So of course, Fred is maybe doing this not just for the mother-in-law, but maybe for himself too. But that's part of negotiation. What Fred's doing is he's changing the outcome valuation. That is, yes, we have our target price. We have our resistance point. But let me tell you something, and maybe that something will change this because if you want your mother to come here for one month and complain every day about the quality of our TV, then maybe a higher price is okay. So that's basically what changing the evaluation of the outcome, the outcome valuation comes down to. That is to say, well, maybe we can change because it's not what I thought it was. Let's go on to a business negotiation and see what that looks like. Let's begin with Fred. Fred says, we can always find other buyers. So they must be a seller. And Alex says, our understanding is that you are having a hard time selling this product and you have a large inventory. So Alex is a buyer and Fred is the seller. So Alex says that you have too much inventory, you cannot sell your product, it's hard for you to sell. And Fred says, I don't know where you got that information but it is not true. This product has been selling very well. Alex says, we heard that sales are not going so well. We can take some of that inventory off your hands, but we need a much bigger discount. Okay, now here we get a very clear kind of business situation, right? Buyer and a seller. The buyer wants to pay less. The seller wants to get a higher price. Now, if the market demand is high, then the seller going to sell to the buyer and the buyer can sell to the consumers and everyone can be happy. That's the goal. But that in between there is distributive, potentially distributive. That is, if I raise the price, you're going to have to sell 
for more. But if the customers are not willing to pay more, then you have to take a loss. And the other way is true too. If I keep selling for less and less to you, and you sell to the market for a higher price, you'll make more. So there has to be this negotiation here that's very distributive. One side wins, one side loses. So in this case, I think that you have a lot of inventory. That means I think your company cannot sell your product. You want to sell to me, I want to buy, but I don't want to pay the high price. I heard information that your inventory is full. You cannot sell. So why do I bring this up? Because I want to ask for a lower price. Fred says, that is not what my managers tell me. All the information I have is that sales are strong. Alex says, look, no one wants to exploit this situation, but we can walk away from this today and you'll end up with nothing. We just need this product. We just don't need this product now. So he's trying to change the conditions by saying, you know, it's hard for you to sell your product. You know, I don't need your product. Uh, your product's okay, but the consumers don't really like it. So give me a lower price. That's the argument. Fred says, what kind of discount are you asking for? And Alex says, at least 50%. So here we begin with that opening offer there, at least 50%. And Fred says, that is more than I'm authorized to approve. I'll have to contact my boss and get directions. And Alex says, I would agree if we weren't facing a deadline. Now, we're gonna talk about these more, but these are all very clear tactics, right? So in this case, we're saying things like, I would like to buy, but your product is not so popular. I would like to buy, but I hear you're not doing very well. I would like to buy, but I think your inventory is high. Are you okay selling your products? Is there a problem, right? I would, I would like to buy, but, so that but is trying to change things, change the valuation of the negotiation. On the other hand, uh, we could say, well, you know, I did not hear that. I don't think that's true. Our product's selling very well, right? Or, you know, you want to get a discount, I cannot say yes, I cannot say no, I must talk to my boss, I must talk to my manager. These are all what we call tactics. There's how do you do it? How do you execute your negotiation, especially in the distributive situation? Fred says, my authorized bargaining limit is 40% discount. That's the most I can give. And Alex says, I have my limit also. And quite honestly, this product just doesn't have a strong demand. So both sides, they say they're being honest, right? Both sides say, oh, to tell the truth, I'm telling you the truth, to be honest. But that's not really true. What they're doing is they're using tactics. And to say, to be honest, is a tactic. I want to tell you some information. I want to give you some of my secret information. Here is my secret information. But is it real? Uh, not necessarily. Fred says, have you considered our new product that's in market testing now? If we lose money on this deal, we may have to reconsider who we sell to in the future. So here Fred is saying, we have another product. That product's really good. And you know what? I might not sell that to you. I might sell that to other competitors and not to you if you do not buy my product now. And Alex says, of course we are interested in getting priority on your new product. In view of maintaining a good relationship, we can reduce our demand to a 40% discount, but that is our bottom line. So here we're talking about what? The relationship, right? This is the relationship. Remember we talked about relationship. We talked about how important is this deal now? How important is the relationship? So the idea is, well, I will give you more. I will give you more discount, but we must keep a good relationship. Fred says, I know my boss is committed to maintaining a good relationship with your firm. However, as I said, 
We cannot take a loss on this deal. So again, Fred is trying to also agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Good relationship, that's good. I agree. I'm trying to help you, but I can't give you this. And Alex says, can you make your commitment more concrete? That means I hear you, you're saying you agree, but what can you do? What can you really do for me? And Fred says, I'm sure we can make a strong commitment to give you our first shipments of the new product, but first we need to compete, first we need to complete this agreement. So if you agree now to this product, then later we will give you the new product first before other competitors. And Alex responds by saying, I might be able to move down on the discount if a commitment is made on the new product. And Fred says, I will need to check with our production department to be sure. But there should be no problem in supplying you with 10,000 units of the first production run. So what are we talking about here? We're not even talking about the product now. We're talking about the next product. Right now we're negotiating about product A. But what are we talking about? We're talking about product B, a future product. Why are we talking about a future product when today I'm negotiating for product A? Well, the reason is product A, we can't come to an agreement. The discount and the asking price are too far apart. The discount request and the discount granted have a big gap. Both sides are too far apart. So what do they do? They say, well, look, maybe we can move together. But how do we move together? Let's make our future relationship better. How do we do that? Promise me, how many will you buy in the future? And how many will you supply me in the future? So that's what we're doing here. We're changing the outcome valuations. Alex says, let's split the difference at 35% and make an informal agreement on first shipment of the new product. So let's go halfway, 35%, and then promise for the quantity of the new product. Okay, so that's a very good example. A little bit more complicated than the family example, but still the exact same idea. And the idea is, well, I, I'm past my resistance point. I don't want to negotiate anymore. I give up. But no, wait, wait, don't give up yet because I want to tell you something. I want to tell you some more information. And that information should let you see, yes, maybe this is more than you want to spend, but I'm going to give you something else. Maybe in the future, I'm going to give you something. Maybe in the present, I'm going to give you something. But I'm going to change that outcome valuation. So that's the idea of this tactic, changing the outcome valuation. Let's jump into our vocabulary now. So these are all vocabulary highly related to how do you do the distributive bargaining when you talk, your tactic, how do you do it? So let's look at some of the words that are very common for this kind of approach. Authorize. Authorize means how much did your boss say you can give? How much discount or how much price can you pay? That's authorize. Commitment. Commitment is a promise for the future. How much are you going to spend in the future? How much do you uh, promise to spend in the future? Commit is the same thing, only it's a verb. I'm going to commit to buying 10,000 units next year. Exploit, usually exploit's a negative word, right? It means I'm going to take advantage or I'm gonna use something to get more. So maybe your company's doing bad, so I'm gonna force you to pay more, or I'm gonna force you to lower your price lower. That's called exploit. Hold out means I don't give you anything. I don't give in easily. I'm going to wait until I get something better. Informal, meaning we're just talking. It's not written down. It's not a contract. It's not fully agreed to. It's informal. Often we can say when we're negotiating, can I ask you informally? That means just between us. It's not official. Inventory. Inventory are the products at the company that are not sold yet. If a company has high inventory, it means they may have trouble selling their products. If they have low inventory, it may mean their products are popular, but it also may mean they're not producing enough. 
limit. Limit is the highest you can go to. So things like your uh, target price can be kind of a beginning limit. Your resistance point is a final limit. You don't want to go past your resistance point. That's a limit. Payment, actually pay for the product, how much you're going to pay. Also payment can be how do you pay? Do you pay at one time, or once a month, over six months, two months later, how do you pay? Priority, meaning you come first. Who comes first? Who comes second? That's called priority. Production, of course, is making the product. Why do we need to know about production? Because if we're the buyer, we need to understand. Is your production capacity enough? Is your production ready to go? When will your production be ready? So production is a key word. Reconsider means think about again or change your idea or change your offer. Reconsider. Shipment. Shipment, of course, is sending the products. When can you make shipment? When can the shipment begin? When can I expect shipment? This is all important in negotiations. We want to know when can we get the product. Special offer, of course, a special offer meaning a special price, a special quantity, a special value, a special uh, packaging. All of these can be special offers. You're giving the customer something more. And usually it's uh, temporary. Not every time can be special, right? So a special offer. Terms. Terms are all the things we discuss in our negotiation. They include things like prices, shipping, packaging, all of these things, service, warranties. Those are the terms. We need to talk about the terms, meaning tell me all the detail and then we can understand what do I buy, when do I buy, how much do I pay, what do I get? Those are the terms. Upper limit, meaning the highest I will go. This is like resistance point, right? My upper limit is... Okay, we're gonna have a little bit of a follow-up here. And so what I'd like to do is, very quickly, talk about uh, what we just saw in our discussions, in our conversations. So getting more information is key. What do we mean when we talk about getting more information? Look back at the conversation, at the dialogue. You can see that each side is trying to say, oh no, your information is wrong, let me tell you my information. Oh no, no, your information is wrong, let me tell you my information. So both sides are always trying to influence or give out that information because information is king in a negotiation. Information is everything. This is key to a sex successful distributive bargaining. The four goals of the negotiator include, one, find out the other side's resistance point. Two, influence the other side's guesses. Three, influence the other side's outcome valuations. And four, influence the cost of delaying or leaving the negotiation the ways to actually get this done are called the tactics. Now we've kind of mentioned these already, right? But we just review them quickly because they're so key, right? What we want to do is we want to keep our secret secret and we want to get the other side's secret information. We want to try to figure out the resistance point if we can. We want to, if we could, get their target price, that would be good. We want to influence what they think of us and then we want to influence what they think the value really is. Okay, now we're going to look at a few specifics. It's a little bit too tiny here for the screen, but you can look inside your book and get the details. What we're doing is we're looking at very specific tactics. You see, so what we did is we started out at the beginning talking about the big idea, making some goals, getting a goal package, then we talk about some overall strategies, the four big strategies, now we're talking about distributive negotiation, then we get down to how do you actually do it, what is the actual tactics that you use, and now we're down to the very specific kinds of words you can use and the specific kinds of tactics you can use. So I'm not going to go over each one in a super detail, but what I would like to do is just quickly shoot over a few of them. Indirect assessment, for example. Indirect assessment means how can you find out what the other side's resistance point is? 
How do you find out what that resistance is? How do you find out what that target is? You can try to check information, maybe check the newspaper, check some articles, check the uh, accounting, uh, public accounting statements of the other company. So you can always try to get information, check the internet, see if you can find something out about the other side and that information will help you understand this product or this uh, price that you're negotiating over now. So indirect meaning, try to find some information from another way. Direct assessment means find information directly from the other side. How can you do that? Well, you could just ask, right? It's very doubtful they'll tell you, but you never know. They might not be careful about keeping their secret information secret. So you could just ask. Another one is when they talk, listen carefully to what the other side says. They may be giving you a clue about their resistance point. They may, giving you a, may, they may be giving you a clue about their limits. Do you, are you listening? Uh, in other ways, you can just ask somebody on the team or maybe you have friends of friends of friends. Maybe you know someone who knows someone who knows someone at the company. Uh, that's another way. That's also kind of, it sounds indirect, but actually it's a little bit direct because you're getting information from people there. That's another direct way, actually. Screening, selective presentation, emotion, all of these are ways to observe the other side or influence the other side to make them think something which you want them to think or to make them react in some way to give you some information. You can also use logic and uh, hide information from the other side. Keep your secret information secret. Hide some information like what is your inventory? What are your sales numbers? What is your cost? What is your capital cost? What is your manufacturing capacity? You can keep these things secret. You can hide them and that could actually influence the other side. So you can use um, logic. You can use outside partners. You can change the schedule of the meeting. For example, oh, we're supposed to meet this morning, but actually we can't make it. We have to postpone the meeting until tonight. Or maybe uh, the other team is flying in on an airplane and they fly for 12 hours on a flight. And then you schedule the meeting for early in the morning the next day and they only get a few hours sleep. So you can schedule things or change schedules to make the other side more tired. How does this help you? It may mean that they're not so good at keeping their secrets. They may make mistakes and tell you information that they would rather not tell you. I know that all sounds a little bit uh, kind of sneaky, a little bit harsh, but these are tactics that are used in negotiation. Again, the key point to remember is you want to get the other side's secret information any way you can. So now I want to look at some negotiation positions. We kind of talked about this earlier in another unit when we talked about how do you begin the first offer, how do you do a follow-up offer. So what I want to talk about is the tactics, the tactics you use to actually influence or to give the signal to help you win as you negotiate. Remember first, that distributive bargaining is all about getting something from the other side. So it's important that the other side give up something and you don't give up something. Or the other side gives up more and you give up less. The key to this is to start with an opening offer that is not close to the resistance point. Remember that? Even your target point, right? We talked about what's your target price, what's your resistance. Now, you want to be away from your resistance and then you want to even be a little bit away from your target because the other side will push you over your target. Now, of course, once you begin, you can say things like in this example, I won't give up anything. Uh, I, I want to help you, but I'm not going to give up anything. So this is kind of the stand you need to take. I'm trying to cooperate, but I'm not going to give anything up. I want to help you, but I'm not going to give in. I would like to come to an agreement, but this is my bottom line. So this is the kind of normal negotiation stand you take with your position. You try to sound like you're helpful, but actually you're going to keep a solid position. You're not going to move. 
Now that's what you present to the other side. That's what you make the other side hear so that they think you're being positive when actually you're trying to also be tough. So what we have here are basically two attitudes. Friendly, I'm trying to help you, and tough, I cannot give you anything more. Friendly, I want us to be happy, I want us to win-win, but tough, this is my bottom line. So these two ideas together, these two attitudes, these two uh, ways, these two tactics to express yourself, call them friendly and tough. One way is friendly, one way is tough. Now when you negotiate, you mix these together, of course, but you tend to prefer one. Are you going to be mostly friendly or are you going to be mostly tough? So if you're going to be mostly friendly, then the opening offer is going to be further from the resistance point than if you're going to be tough. In other words, if you're going to be friendly, then your resistance point, you need to begin much further away because you're going to have to give up more because you're trying to be nice, you're trying to be friendly. Oh, okay, I'll give you something, I'll give you something, I'll give you something. This makes the other side think that you're, you're being friendly, you're cooperating, so you give up more and then they give up more and then you come to a conclusion sooner. The other way is to be tough. And if you're gonna to be tough, that means I don't give in, I don't give you one cent, I don't give one dollar. You keep saying it's my bottom line, I cannot give you any more. But if you do that, then you must begin closer to your resistance point because the other side is gonna keep trying to push you, but you're not going to move. If you begin very, very far away and you're very, very tough, it's going to be very hard to get an agreement because you're so far and you're not going to move. And remember, in negotiation, it's a process. You have to give things up. You cannot give nothing up, right? But the question isn't distributive. Can we give up less and can we get more? Even though the other side may not like the tough attitude, this approach can make the negotiation shorter. Because you begin closer to your resistance and you say, that's it, that's all I'm going to do and I'm not going to change. And if you give something, you give very, very little bit at one time and then the other side gets tired and then you come to a conclusion faster. On the other hand, if you're going to be friendly, you need to begin further away. And if you begin further away from your resistance point, you have to give up something, give up something, talk, 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 give up something, give up something, and it takes more time. So the tough negotiation, although it seems like it's harder, actually, in the end, may make the negotiation shorter. Not always, but it is possible. Once the other side sees how hard it is, they're going to give up, they don't want to keep fighting, and then you can move forward. Okay, but if you're too tough, if you're too hard, what happens? Well, if you're too tough, if you're too hard, if you're too far from the resistance point and you're over the other side's resistance point, they'll just walk away, they will give up, they will not negotiate, that's possible. Okay, now let's go ahead and look at a nice simple diagram here. And in this diagram we can see um, what I'm talking about, a little bit more graphical, right? Let me give you a nice clear look at that. So we have an arrow, right? And this is moving through time, moving through time. So we're going to be moving across time from the opening offer up here over to opening attitude, first concession, more concessions, final offer over there at the end. So we begin and then we continue until the end. So what happens when we have our opening offer? Well, um, let me give you a nice clearer shot here, a nice close up. Opening offer. Don't start too close to your resistance point. Start further away. And then opening attitude means you start out friendly or tough. You can be friendly or tough. Of course you have a little bit of both, but you can be mostly friendly or mostly tough. But you can't really be half tough and half friendly because the other side will be confused. At one minute you say, I will not give, give anything. This is my bottom line. Uh, okay, I'll give you what you want. But that's my bottom line. Okay, I'll give you that too, but that's my bottom line. 
Okay, I'll give you some. But that's really my bottom line. This is my last bottom line. You see, that's not very strange, right? Can't really do that. So what do we do? If you're going to be friendly, start further away from your resistance point. If you're going to be tough, begin closer. But try to be mostly one or the other. So as you move across, you have a consistent attitude. If you take a strong stand, then your first concession will be tiny. If you take a friendly one, then it may be bigger and you may give more. And then you give more concessions. How many do you give? If you're being friendly, you give many. If you're being tough, you give few. And finally, you get to the final offer. So the key point here is to remember the negotiation has a beginning and an end. So you've got to move through time. As you move through time, you're going to give something. How much do you give and how much time does that take? Those are key questions. Are you being friendly or are you being tough? Okay, let's do a little bit more follow-up here. And in this follow-up, if the concessions are made, the negotiation will not move forward. What does this mean? If you don't give anything, you cannot possibly move forward. So you gotta give something. You gotta give something. You cannot, you cannot give nothing. A tough stand, fewer concessions. A friendly stand, more concessions. In both cases, Concessions are important, so I don't want to tell you be tough and you never give anything. You give something, but how many concessions and how much do you give depends on your stand. Concessions should become smaller though. Even if you're being tough, even if you're being uh, friendly, your concessions should become smaller and smaller. In this way, the other side will think the concessions are nearing the resistance point. And let me give you a little picture here to show you what I mean. So I like this picture because it's very easy to understand. So what we're saying in this picture here is, as the negotiation moves forward, you give more concessions. You begin and you give something, you give something, you give something. Okay, now, what you can do is, you can say, I'm going to give you something, four dollars. Or you can say I'm gonna give you nothing, zero dollars. So I'm gonna give you nothing. I'm not gonna give you, I'm not gonna give up anything. I'm not gonna change at all. Or I can say here four dollars. So what does this mean? Well I give you four dollars. I'll I'll cut the price four dollars for you. And then you say oh thank you okay blah 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 and then you then I say okay I cut the price another four dollars for you. And you say, oh, okay, thank you, but you know, the price is still too high. And I say, okay, I'll cut the price $4 for you. You follow me? So if I keep giving you $4, $4, $4, what do you think? You think, well, he gave me $4, then he gave me $4, then he gave me $4. He can give me another $4. So if you give up more and you keep giving the same amount, then the other side will think you can still give more. But a better way is you begin by giving $4 and then next time you give $2 and then next time you give $1 and in this way it looks like you've already given everything you can give. So I begin by giving up a little bit more and then I give a little bit less and then I give a little bit less and each time I give less now it looks like I have no more to give you. You see? So over time, if you're being tough or if you're being friendly, it's the same thing. It's just how long does it take? You give up less and less so that the other side thinks you don't have anything more to give up. You cannot give nothing. You cannot just say, I give you nothing because then it won't move forward. You have to give some concessions. But how much do you give? Well, it depends on are you being tough, are you being friendly, and then you need to over time change that to be less and less. So as the negotiation gets very near the end, you give less and less, the other side gives less and less, what happens? 
as you get to the end, that's when the negotiation may get very hard. At the beginning, I give something, you give something, we both give something, that's normal. But then we get to the hardest questions, the hardest part. This is when we need to have that final push. And this is very normal negotiation. You spent a long time, you worked out many things, you made a lot of progress, now is the final push. And that is not easy. So how do you final push to find your agreements? What's the things you can do, the tactics you can do for the final push? Here we have a few things in our book. For example, provide alternatives. Maybe you can give something else or do something else. Another thing you can do is assume a deal. This is very common. What does assume a deal mean? It means that we're talking, talking, and I want, I need one more dollar. And you say, no, I will not give you a dollar. And it's just a dollar. And you say, no, I cannot give you a dollar. And then I say, okay, it's a deal. And you say, no, no, well, I didn't give you a dollar. I said, no, no, that's okay. I know you're gonna give me a dollar. I assume, I assume. I just say, well, we can do it, it's okay. I think you'll do it, I trust you, I believe you, and then you just say it's a deal. It's not really a deal, but sometimes that works. You can also split the difference. What is split the difference? Half and half. The little bit that's left, just cut it in half. A deadline offer means I'm gonna give you some time, and before this time, if you agree, it's okay, but after this time, game over, I'm walking away. That'll give the other side pressure to push to the end. Sometimes you can do what's called a sweetener. A sweetener means you give something extra. Maybe you promise to buy more, or you promise to, in the future, buy from them again. Or as a supplier, you promise to give them a new product in the future, or a product they don't have today, or a product that's very popular in the future, like in our example. So to sum up today, a lot of material in this chapter, a lot of technical material, a lot of detail material, especially on the vocabulary and those charts showing you the different tactics. Why so much detail? Because today's chapter is about tactics. How do I do it? It's easy to talk about, but how do I actually do it? And then what's the main point today? We take away from this chapter, this unit, we take away this idea of you've got to make the other side lose something so that you can gain something. There's just no other way in distributive bargaining. How do I do that? Well, you've got to give something. You've got to give something, but make sure what you give is smaller than what you get. How do you do that? Carefully make sure as you're moving forward through the negotiation, you make the other side think, I cannot give any more. I've given you four dollars. I've given you two dollars. I've given you one dollar. That's all. I don't have anything more to give. By making the other side think this, you create a situation where they will soon stop. Or the other thing is get their secret information. If you know their resistance point, if you know their target point, then you're able to make offers that benefit you more. Not easy to do. How do you do it? Talk to them, ask them, watch them carefully, listen to them, watch their group who is saying something, maybe ask friends of friends, check information. Okay, so a little bit detailed. Hope you didn't fall asleep. Good luck with your negotiation and see you next time.